Clarissa frantically called 911 and told the operator that she was 36 weeks pregnant and had just given birth at home, but the baby wasn't breathing and had turned blue. Paramedics quickly arrived and took Clarissa and baby Zander to the hospital, where he was rushed to intensive care. Hospital staff noticed that Clarissa's arms, hands and face were covered in blood, assumedly from the home delivery. But when they managed to check Clarissa over, they made the chilling discovery that she showed no signs at all of having given birth. Red Rum is a podcast focusing on the true victims of crime. Search Red Rum True Crime wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast contains adult language and stories of true crime. If you don't like laughing, crying, or being horrified at the actions of other humans, this podcast is not for you. And welcome to Season 4, Episode 9, Part 1. This is Resolved Mysteries, where the show where we rewatch, recap, and give you the latest updates to cases featured on the show, Unsolved Mysteries. I'm Allison. I'm Eliza. And I'm Carlin. Welcome to the show. As most of you know, for every review that we receive, we donate a dollar to a different organization. And this month's organization is the Wild Bird Fund, recommended to us by our patron, Thomas G. Love That's it. That's nice. What a doll. We do love birds in oh, this household. Honey. And Thomas G lives in New York City, baby. Yeah, baby. So he says, I'll go local and plug the Wild Bird Fund. It is surprisingly the, quote, only wildlife rehabilitation center in New York City. City, and they take tons of walk-ins and fly-ins of sick, injured wild birds and small mammals. And Thomas G, correct me if I'm wrong, honey, I believe that Thomas G sent us the fruitcake. Yeah, I think you're right. Unless we have two Thomas Gs. I don't think so. I think there is okay. only one and only Thomas G that lives in New York City oh, and makes a boozy, boozy ass is. Is. Thomas G, maker of fruitcakes, lover of birds. Yes. Thank you. And also a heavy thing to ship and pay for. <laughs> Not at all. We the heaviest of cakes. We love them all around. Thank you, Thomas G. So for every review you guys leave this month, we're going to donate a dollar to the Wild Bird Fund. <whistles> oh, my God. Was that a wild bird? It was a wild <laughs> If you'd like to recommend a nonprofit for us to support and support us on Patreon, you'll get access to ad-free episodes, two additional episodes a month, early access to listener short stacks, along with goodies in the mail. Go to patreon.com slash resolve mysteries podcast. Okay, this is a goodie. What are we covering this episode, ladies? Okay. I have got the televangelist bomber, baby. And we have a Lost Loves about Kathy Loving. Oh, so appropriate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then in part two. Part two, I kick it off again with the unexplained death of Beverly McGowan. Oh, that's such a goodie. And then I wrap it up with the wanted segment of Sal Gordado. All right. Ready? Here we go. Let's Here do we it. go. Okay. As I mentioned... In some episode, maybe last episode, if you have not watched Righteous Gemstones, just stop now and go watch this, that, before you listen to this. Okay, I gotta go. (laughs) Yeah, Colin's gotta go. It's so good. It will, it's just, it all works together, BB. We love a televangelist. Oh my gosh, were you medium triggered like me when you saw these people on the television? Of course. We were raised evangelical, what can we say? We didn't, we didn't even call it that then, it was so long ago. Mm Mm-mm. Okay. So this is the televangelist bomber. He's wanted. And the stack tells us that, oh boy. Now this is a trip. Televangelist Pat Robertson's daily broadcasts over CBN, the Christian Broadcast Network, are seen in nearly a million households nationwide. Stack says, but his outspoken stance on controversial issues has made him the target of hate mail and death threats. So just a quick update. If you don't know, Pat Robertson is still around and still doing the 700 Club oh on my. CBN. 
and he's an actual garbage person. <laughs> hmm. Ooh, okay. I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs from the Wikipedia in case you're like, don't be mean. He really is. He's opposed to abortion and same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. He has described feminism as a socialist, anti-family political movement that encourages women to leave their husbands, kill their children, practice witchcraft, destroy capitalism, and become lesbians. This is this man's okay. beliefs. Okay. Many of Robertson's views mirror those of fellow evangelical activist pastor Jerry, Jerry Falwell. Falwell who made frequent appearances on the 700 Club. He agreed with Falwell when Falwell stated that the September 11th terrorist attacks were caused by pagans, abortionists, feminists, gays, lesbians, the ACLU, and the People for the American Way. Okay. All right. Wow. It goes on and on. Now, I'm not saying that this man deserves to die. I just want to give... I just thought it was interesting that Stack does say he was controversial even then in the early 90s. This guy is still around 30 years later spewing this shit. Yikes. Mm. Hate yeah. it. And is rich as they come. So Pat Robertson's broadcasts originated from his headquarters in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Each day, thousands of letters and packages arrive at the CBN mailroom, most of them donations from viewers, of course. But on April 27th, 1990, Scott Sheepers, who we love, a CBN security guard, a true sweetie, was called to the mailroom to check a package addressed to Pat Robertson. He is a talking head on here and also a victim, and he says, When I looked at the package on the monitor of the x-ray machine, I didn't see anything that led me to believe there was a problem or it was really suspicious. Sheepers remained on guard and decided to check the contents of the package. He was baffled by several strips of newspaper sticking out of the box. Quote, I was still somewhat skeptical about it. So I stepped away from the box as far as I could get and took my left hand and extended it out, grabbed the lid of the box and opened it. Aww. As Scott opened the box, he was thrown to the floor by an explosion. He felt a severe pain in the upper part of his left leg and his stomach and then all the way over to his right leg. He says, I made the determination that this is it. You know, it's either lay here and possibly die or get up and get help. Hmm. Scott Sheepers was rushed to a nearby hospital where he underwent emergency surgery to remove shrapnel embedded in his leg. Ugh. He counts himself as very fortunate, which he is. Honestly, when you deal with an explosion like that, it's like a matter of inches can really make a huge difference. So Truly. the fact that he got as far away as he could might have saved his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The trauma room doctor said if he had been holding, like, holding the package, like, most package bombs are meant to be opened some in the hands of someone. Right. That he would not have survived for sure. And he says, so I consider myself very, very fortunate that it wasn't any worse than it was. But, of course, he suffered tremendous trauma. It's pretty terrible. Um, so authorities determined that the package contained a homemade pipe bomb. Mr. Robertson, Pat Robertson, who was a candidate, I didn't know this, for the 1988 Republican presidential nomination, mm. said the package had been addressed directly to him. He said, this could be the work of witches and pagans. <laughs> and gays. And gays. It's the gays. This could be part of a pattern of attacks against evangelical Christians. You know, they are the most targeted group. They are the victims, for sure. Yes. Constant suffering. Yes. <laughs> but he noted two recent attacks to try and back up his claim. And one was one that I did not know about, which was the explosion of a package bomb at the home of Reverend John Osteen of Houston. Oh, the father of Joel Osteen? Uh-huh. Wow. And also an arson fire at the Indiana recording studio of Sandy Patty, who is a Honey. white ass gospel singer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. A white, that curly, a, blonde haired gospel that, singer. That's an important call out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at you guys. You're just taking <laughs> I'm just really? thinking about how much Sandy Patty Eliza's mom probably listened to. You know, we were more of an Amy Grant household, really. Oh, same honey. Until, you know, she's she uh straight. And then it was tough for us. I played that cassette over and over and over and over. 
But she strayed from the faith and what are we supposed to do? Heart in motion. Oh, heart in motion, the best one. Oh, yeah. She didn't really stray from the faith. Oh, if you need to know anything about this, go listen to the Good Christian Fun podcast. They're the best. Okay, so authorities quickly linked the bomb to an earlier attack aimed at another televangelist, Pastor John Osteen. If the name Osteen sounds familiar, he is the father, as we said, of Joel Osteen, who is, wow, a very rich-ass pastor today, (laughs) currently. That was the nicest thing that she could say. (laughs) Oh, my God. He is so wealthy. Wow. He has a lot of money. Let me give you the figures. But I really actually didn't know. We were not like an Osteen family. I've never heard this name. Oh. You know who Joel Osteen is. Let me show you a picture. But also, I didn't know he this he inherited this church from his father. So the church was one of the largest in America and seated more than 8,000 worshipers. Well, oh. now, this church still exists. The youngest son in the family, Joel Osteen, is the pastor, and the church estimates that 7 million viewers per week watch their services on TV. In America? Uh, could be over the world. Okay. A program that Joel started and produced when his father was still the pastor. So, like, in the 80s, he's like, hey, we got to use television to get it out there. And now he is the pastor of the church and Hmm. okay, a televangelist. Um, But also in person, it has about 45,000 attendees. Holy shit. You might remember Joel Osteen from the fact that when Houston was flooding, they would not open Lakewood Church. Right. I remember oh, that. That was super gosh. recent, right? Like yeah. A months ago. Like to house people, right? Well, it's like a couple of years ago, I think. They wouldn't open the doors of their no. church to help people in need. No. <laughs> Joel Osteen lives with his family in a 17,000 square foot mansion in River Oaks with an estimated value of $10.5 million. And his net worth is between 40 and $60 million. Wow. Again, you gotta watch Righteous Gemstones to help you laugh about how fucked up this is. Okay, like Pat Robertson, Pastor John Osteen, the dad, used television to spread the gospel, and he was also the target of a similar mail bomb. On January 30th, 1990, three months before the CBN bombing, John Osteen's daughter and Joel Osteen's sister, Lisa Combs, arrived in her office to open the day's mail. This bitch has got the hair that you want. It's my mom's hair, honestly. It is is my mom's hair. hair. It is your current right now mom's hair. Yeah. (laughs) And wow, exactly what she looks like from 85 until I would say 2003. (laughs) This is the hair that she had. Lisa says, quote, I felt like it was safe to open the package because I open a lot of packages because we've never had any problems and this looked like an ordinary package. It had a label addressed to my dad, typewritten to my dad, and then it had a return address. And you're not really suspicious of things like that. It was just a cardboard box and it had one piece of tape on it. I have to say, the directing <gasps> on these reenactments is really good because the suspense builds, builds, builds. When yeah, they cut that tape? I was into it. Oh. Honey, it was a close-up on that pink press-on nail oh, slicing, slicing through that tape. Slicing that tape. You could feel oh. it. <laughs> feel what your nail would feel like cutting oh through that God. tape. She says, I opened the box when I was sitting down. And really, the next thing I remember is I was standing about five feet away from my chair and I was very shaken as if I'd had an electrical shock. I'll never forget the feeling. So did you picture her just standing there and then poof, suddenly teleporting? Back? Well, God yeah. saved her. So, okay. So Lisa suffered third-degree burns from this explosion. Honestly, both of these could have been so much worse. And again, mm-hmm. we, we are so glad that they did not die because we've seen so many other bombing cases, Unabomber for one, where people died. It's yeah. awful. She suffered third-degree burns and cuts on her right leg and abdomen but recovered quickly and just four weeks later returned to the pulpit. And do they ever show it? It's her. It's her dad. It's her mom. They're all on the stage. The whole family. Everyone's there. It's a family affair. 8,000 cheering for the fact that she is in one piece. Little did they know, 45,000 people would be in attendance later. It's they crazy. Knew. Well, yeah. 
So according to Kenneth Weaver, who was the chief postal inspector, we love a postal inspector, (laughs) of the eastern region, the box used in both bombings, this is really interesting, Mm -hmm. was the type used by candle distributors. Yeah, I love that. Yes. And he says there was some printed material on the outside of the box, which had been scratched out with the word burgundy. We found that both of these packages were mailed from small towns near Fayetteville, North Carolina. The National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crimes researched all the evidence in both the bombing cases. They said, number one, that this individual responsible for the bombings had some type of stress or turmoil in his life. Okay. Secondly, they felt that anyone around or in the presence of the bomber would have known a difference in this person's behavior. Which is probably true, like, when you think about the Unabomber case, he was out in nowhere where no one ever saw him. Well, and that's the same thing they say about people who have murdered someone. Yeah, you'll notice a change. change. Yeah. Yeah. So all actually pretty good clues. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially these candle boxes. What could, where could they be from? Yankee candle. <laughs> yeah. And it's solved. It's Yankee. <laughs> Yankee candle. <laughs> I will stand till the day I die for Yankee candle, so you can't sway me. I have to go to that store. I want to go someday. Oh, honey, you got to go to the big one. I know. Oh, what it's state like is it in? For How will I go there? Isn't it um, on the East Coast? Yes. What state is it in? New Hampshire? I thought it was in New Hampshire, Connecticut. It might be New Hampshire. It might be Connecticut. I don't know. They're the same. I got to go. So a composite sketch depicted the man who was seen mailing the bombs. Apparently there was a witness sighting. He's described as a neatly dressed white male with brown hair. He has an average build and weighs between 160 and 175 pounds. Both bombs were mailed from within 25 miles of Fayetteville, North Carolina. The U.S. Postal Inspection Service was offering a reward of up to $50,000 in the case. That's a big reward. It's big. Holy moly. These evangelicals have got money in all sorts of things, so they got to offer a big reward. They probably put it up, so. Recently, around the time of the 2000s... You refuse to say the odds. You hate saying you it. You hate saying early odds. Oh, I would never. That's a, not a word I know. Oh, I've always said it. Me too. Always. Oh. Okay, so some have suggested that Olympic Park bomber Eric Rudolph may have been responsible for the bombings. Mm. So he committed the 1996 attacks, and those attacks on the Olympics were similar in design to the televangelist bombs. He was also apparently against materialism and born-again Christians, so it all sort of fits. Mm -hmm. But he's never actually been connected to the bombings. In fact, these bombings are unsolved. Whoa. And the Sandy Patty arson (laughs) that I mentioned earlier was eventually solved and was just, I don't even want to go into it because it's kind of a sad story, but like not linked to the bombings at all. Who did it? I would have to like look up his name, but it's like a just unwell, an unwell person. Had okay. nothing to do with like anti Christian okay. stuff. Yeah. Just kind of a sad story. So I can see how like the evangelical movement felt like the Sandy Patty thing, the CBN thing, and the John Osteen thing was were all related. Mm-hmm. But it seems like the Sandy Patty thing arson is not related and the two bombings probably were but no other bombings related were ever found and the person who actually did the bombings never came forward and has not been found wow Mm. also i'm assuming everyone knows that eric rudolph is the atlanta olympics bomber i mean i didn't i don't remember oh but i'm sure that's out there yeah i don't think it's a spoiler yeah yeah so I really thought this was going to be solved. Me too. It's Me not too. solved. And it is not a solved. Wow. That's wild. Wow. It definitely changed things for how high profile people have to do their security, of oh course. Oh my gosh, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I also was able to find on Facebook the security guard from Pat Robertson's offices, who was the victim in this case, Scott Sheepers. He is a total sweetie. I think he truly was just 
working. Like, he's just working. He's not, yeah. like, actually... Which I think we do, like, often lump people in yes, to yeah. they all must believe this thing. Totally. I totally did. Yeah, it was just a job for him. It yeah. was just a job. He was just a security in. guard. So yeah. that made me feel... Again, not that I want anyone to be hurt. I think it's actually... This is awful to happen to anyone. Mm-hmm. But he just seems like a true sweetie. It seems like things like mail bombings and stuff like that used to be so hard to solve. Because yeah. Because there was no process. There were no checks in place mm-hmm. to stop it. And they had a lot of like – They had a ton the of The candle thing could have been something, you yeah. know. I mean there have been other people who they have thought could have been it. But like one of them was this guy – uh, Richard Jewell. Oh, I know that name. He also bombed like a queer nightclub. Mm, great. So like, there's no crossover. Yeah. Yeah, also yeah, like yeah. a women's health clinic. So yeah. Hmm. Okay. That kind of is crossover. I don't know. Just I guess there is kind of crossover. Actually, I remember the name. Richard if he Jewell. hates queers, he hates women's rights. Yeah. Why would he? He, why would he yeah, bomb yeah, a Christian the organization? Because that, <laughs> that is a tough end diagram, and you can cut that if you want to. Okay, go watch Righteous Gemstones. That's it. Unsolved. Oh my right. gosh. Well, good job. Evil Transgression, your homicide headquarters in podcasting. Tune in weekly to the lesser known crimes and criminals. Join us, Josh. Dustin and Rex as we dive into the cases and discuss just what may have led to these evil acts modern murders and crimes of yesterday evil women and monsters of men get your quick dose of true crime each week with easy to follow to the point episodes that keep you wanting more who would have thought evil could be this entertaining available on Apple Spotify Stitcher Podbean Google and all other major podcasting platforms Visit eviltransgression.com for more info. Imagine, if you dare. Whoa, 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 hold tight. Let's. A podcast so shocking. No, it's not that shocking. It's just. So disturbing. Now you're just being dramatic. That it will chill you to your very core. I don't. Have you even heard the show? There's no escaping. I mean, there is. The horrible just, consequences of. Just press pause, but don't do that. Right day. My name is Byron McCoy, and each week I join my friends Sam and Kelly, where we talk films, monsters, the paranormal, and pretty much all things frightening. From time to time, we talk with like-minded specialists, directors, actors, cryptozoologists, conspiracy theorists, but whether it's the human terror of serial killers and home invasions, or the extra-normal phenomena Kelly covers in her Cryptids and Conspiracies segment, if it bleeds, hacks, stabs, chops, summons, sacrifices, abducts, or bites, it is Fright Day. Every week on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at FrightDay.com. FrightDay.com. Stop it. You're scaring them. Sorry. Okay, this is the Lost Love segment about Kathy Loving. And our segment opens with a reenactment of schoolgirls in saddle shoes and slip-ons and they're jumping rope and singing Miss Mary Mac, baby. Oh, cuties. We sang it when we were in school. Apparently everyone's been doing it forever. Stack tells us that it's July 1961 in the streets of Southside, Chicago. He says the streets echoed with the laughter of children. Quote, but far from the delightful sounds of summer, a hidden crime has been committed. Mm. One young girl has been stripped of her innocence. So as the camera pans over a house that's a giant mess, um, it's got stuff strewn everywhere. There's food laying all over the place. And Stack says the night before, 14-year-old Kathy Williams was forced to participate in a drunken party and then fell prey to the abusive sexual advances of her stepfather, Clifford Starks. <sighs> Hate it. Hate. Hate it. Kathy is interviewed and she says... I awoke in the middle of Clifford's bed, with Clifford actually laying almost on top of me. Ugh. He was naked. I was totally naked. I remember his hands all over my breasts. Well, I knew that was wrong, and I didn't know what else had happened. I couldn't remember. And that scared me, too. So I took off, and that's why I wrote the letter, and I thought that would be the end of it in a child's mind. And I was thinking, well, this will take care of everything. I can get out of here, and I'll be safe. Mm Mm-hmm. So in the reenactment, the actress is great. Um, She is crying and she's writing out, I'm never coming back. Never, never, never. 
Mm. Stack says that what happened the night before was the culmination of months of horror for Kathy. So she felt she had no choice but to run away. But since Kathy had nowhere to go, she was picked up off the streets by her stepfather, who brought her home where she was beaten and held prisoner (sighs) in a relative's apartment, locked into a small room for more than a week. Jesus. Which I'm like, at this point, you're both abusers, like whoever this relative is. Yeah. Because in the reenactment, she is screaming bloody murder, pounding on the door, begging to be let out. And it's horrible. (sighs) Then uh, we find out that making this even worse, if that's possible, is that Kathy's stepfather was a, quote, respected detective Mm. in the Chicago Police Department. That makes it like 100 million percent worse. (laughs) Because who's going to rescue you? No one. So, Kathy was desperate and went to the police anyway. When she was there, she was questioned by an officer who, in the reenactment, it's also a black woman. So, I'm like, okay, like, Mm -hmm. this is going to be okay. When being questioned by the officer, Kathy pretends to have amnesia. Mm -hmm. The woman is asking her what her name is, and she says she doesn't know. She asks her a few more questions, and then she gets stern with her. And in the reenactment, you see her grabbing her arms. And at first, I thought she was, like, checking her for track marks or something. But she's actually, like, checking for bruises because Mm. she's getting that something's going on at home. And this girl is lying because she's scared. Amazing. Uh. So Kathy's plan with with the amnesia was she was hoping that her stepfather would not find out that she was the one there. And she'd be sent somewhere else to live and she could be free from him. So Kathy says they listed her as a Jane Doe, and she was so relieved, and she thought anywhere they sent her would be better than the hellhole she ran away from. Gosh, oh what God. a queen. She's a queen. Amazing. She's, like, doing the only thing she can. Yeah. She's surviving. Mm-hmm. So the officer tells her if she's having problems at home, running away won't solve them. She asks, do you have any brothers and sisters? And she convinces her that if she's having problems, that most likely they are, too. <laughs> Which mm. is true, and I think that is why the officer was doing it, but it's just like... It's not Kathy's problem, this no. poor girl. She can't get those kids out if she doesn't get out. Yeah. So the officer essentially guilts her into telling the truth. Kathy starts to cry and tells her that her stepfather has been molesting her. Mm. And Kathy says that the woman said, You poor child, we'll do anything and everything we can to help you. Kathy says that everyone was empathetic, and she thought, this is the police. Maybe they really can help me. Mm. She says she thought of her two younger sisters and thought that they didn't need to be there where the same thing could happen to them, and she Mm. had not thought about that until the officer said it. Mm. (sighs) Which, well, she's just too nice. So right as Kathy was feeling hopeful, her worst fear came true, and her stepfather was notified that she was there at the precinct. Oh, the worst. That's a nightmare. Yes. It's a total it's nightmare. It's like a horror movie. It really is. It is, is. a that, horror movie. Yeah. You, there is nowhere to go. Yeah. I would really hope that that's not the process anymore. Like, even if that's your only parental figure or whatever, do not let them know if they're the abuser. Like, he just comes and collects her. I know. This is one story we're hearing about. Like, how many times yeah. did that happen mm-hmm. that we it's don't terrible. know? It's awful. Kathy says, once Clifford came to the police station and flipped out his badge, that was the end of me. Mm. And in the reenactment, he just is like the meanest, grossest dick bitch. And he's like, I'm here to pick up my daughter. Get her down here. Mm. Kathy says, he came omnipotent. I became a pile of nothing. Mm. Which is just like the most heartbreaking sentence. Mm. So the officer at the desk in the front is calling a different area of the prison saying, like, her stepfather is here for her. And then he tells Clifford, she doesn't want to go home with you. And he says, if she doesn't want to go home with me, then lock her up. So they do. (gasps) What the hell? She says, and upon my refusal to go home with him, I was then shackled with handcuffs and thrown into the back of a paddy wagon like a common criminal taken off to the county jail. (sighs) Yeah, like a juvenile delinquent. It's just like you said. It's like a never-ending nightmare. And just Mm -hmm. no one is questioning him. No one is standing up for her in front of him. No. That's awful. She's she's a child. She's traumatized, tortured, thrown in jail, like she did something wrong, and the officers knew she had been abused. It's like completely despicable. It's disgusting. Yeah. It's like next level. It's so fucked up. Kathy says they labeled her incorrigible according to existing Illinois state law. They kept her in jail overnight, and then she was sent to a home for delinquent minors. 
Four months later, Kathy went to a hearing in juvenile court. Stack says many of her neighbors came to the hearing prepared to testify on her behalf. Mm. We love these neighbors. So they say the hearing is starting and the officer says um, that since it's juvenile court, proceeding is limited to immediate family members, so the neighbors cannot come in. No. Uh, no. The only people on her side. Like, and what happens when your immediate family member is sexually assaulting you? There's just nothing here for her. Ugh. So Kathy, she says she remembers when the hearing started, they couldn't find her case file because it had disappeared. Mm. The file had affidavits supporting her allegations of sexual abuse. So obviously this is Clifford having a hand in this. Mm -hmm. Kathy says that day the judge's decision was based solely on the testimony of Clifford Starks. The only person's testimony taken into account was the accused abuser. Fucking insane everything Jesus. about this is wrong it's just wrong when the file went missing they should have said we we need to stop this hearing yeah yes the file's missing and just for it to pass through this many hands mm-hmm. and no one is putting a stop to anything it makes mm-hmm. no sense mm-hmm. one person is not standing up for what's right in this yeah. yeah it's like all these people are like well that we just have to go through the motions then <sighs> So this dick bitch Starks tells them that she's always staying out at night, not coming home. She hangs out with a bad group of kids and she's trouble. He says she was an incorrigible runaway teenager prostitute, (sighs) which she wasn't a sex worker. (laughs) Until he made her one when he threw that party and had his friends sexually assault her and he sexually assaulted her. So he tells them she's doing drugs, and the judge just believes everything he says. He does not believe a child who is saying they're being abused. And she is sentenced to be confined to the Illinois State Training School for Girls at Geneva until she turns 18. I can't remember. Is the stepdad also black? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think, like, the judge and the social worker were the only white people in this segment. Yeah. Mm, Okay. Kathy says to her it felt like the end of the world. Quote, I didn't know I could feel that kind of pain or that much hurt. Every time you think it's bad, you just think it couldn't get worse, but it gets worse. And when you look over at your family and friends, it's like, now it's proven that I'm wrong. It's like, obviously, it wouldn't have happened if I wasn't bad, and maybe I did deserve this. Like, at that age, you don't even know that what's being done to you is completely despicable and wrong. Like, you would just want to die. Like, you'd be so stuck. So Kathy's put in custody of a sheriff to be taken to the reform school. And I'm just like, oh, God, no, something else bad is about to happen to her. Stack says she had no idea that this ride would become a remarkable turn of fortune. Mm. Kathy is so cute. She says, when they put me in the back of that paddy wagon, I just started boo-hooing. She says it dawned on her that she didn't know where she was going. Nobody knew where she was going. And she thought it would have to be hell. So in the paddy wagon, she starts telling the deputy that she didn't do anything wrong. She starts telling him why she's in there. And amazingly, he starts listening to her. Yes. She is the most amazing advocate for herself. Yes. She could have easily just been terrified and curled into a ball and wanted to die. Yes. And she was still trying. So by the time they got to the school, Stack says the deputy was convinced that the system had made a terrible mistake. And Kathy was obviously being punished for being a victim. The officer tells Kathy that he believes her and he wants to check into it for her. Thank God there's one person doing yes, the right thing here. finally. Yeah. Kathy says she didn't know if she could believe he would help her because she'd believed everyone else before and she was still being sent away. Mm. But she says there was something kind in his eyes that made her want to believe him and she thought maybe he could do something. So it turns out, risking his own job, the deputy was true to his word. Seven weeks later, Kathy would be taken to the state building in downtown Chicago to meet with a social worker. The deputy, who we don't even know the name of, had listened to everything Kathy said, including names of friends and family she had provided, and he'd contacted them and put them in touch with authorities. Some of them had even signed affidavits corroborating the accusations Kathy made against her stepfather. So in the reenactment, we finally see Kathy smiling for the first time. And he tells her some of the people they were put in contact with. And you can just see, like, the hope coming back into her eyes. Mm. So the social worker says it looks like she'd been railroaded and that they'd have some evidence to support that. So he's like, you'll go back to school, keep your head down, stay out of trouble, and you'll hear from me again. She says, 
okay, but she says that she knew it was going to be another bubble and it was going to pop and float off into the sunset like the rest. (sighs) But amazingly, two weeks later, Kathy was actually released from the reformatory. She was declared an emancipated minor and was allowed to live with friends in the neighborhood. And we just love these neighbors. They're so nice. They're her real family. So Kathy says it was just like New Year's, you know, counting down the clock. It was just a very happy, happy time. And they show her and the friends and family are like waiting outside the windows and like knocking and smiling and waving at her. Quote, I was finally able to go home with my new mother and father and my new sisters. So it was a joyous occasion. Um, And it's just so nice. And they all hug her and they're cheering. And oh, it's the best. Stack says, Kathy flourished in her new family and started a church group that offered counseling to abused children. Mm. Kathy is just a queen. Mm -hmm. Stack says that Kathy would never forget the unknown deputy who lent a helping hand when no one else would. Kathy says every girl would want the prince on a horse or a knight in shining armor, and she says with a big smile, and he'd be my knight in the paddy wagon. (laughs) If I could find him, I just want to say to him that many people reach out for help and many are, are refused help. But because of the fact that I reached out to him and he acknowledged me and gave me the help that I needed, he gave me my life. Mm. And I just noted that I want Kathy to give some of that credit to herself because she made these moves and got herself out of here by telling the truth. Truly, by not giving up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She says that he not only gave her her life, quote, I have a healthy son who's here. And then they show him and he is truly like a supermodel. He is so beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) And she, I mean, she's beautiful, too, so it's like the apple doesn't fall far. Um, She says she's touched uh, other people's lives in many ways, and they show a photo of her in this, like, gorgeous slinky gold dress just looking like a fucking movie star. Right. And Kathy says, had it not been for him, none of that would have happened. And then we get an update sentence. Cook County Deputy Fred Lyle was watching this program and recalled meeting the young girl 30 years earlier. Yes. At their reunion, Kathy was finally able to thank the man she credits with saving her life. Awesome. So I searched but could not find any, you know, sometimes you'll find a news article mm-hmm. about the reunion or something right. like that. So I just have the blurb from Fandom, which says, uh, Former Deputy Sheriff Fred Douglas Lyle saw the broadcast and realized that he was the deputy that Kathy was looking for. He left the sheriff's department in 1965. He has four children and eight grandchildren. That evening, he and Kathy spoke on the phone and made arrangements for a reunion. On July 18, 1992, Fred and one of his daughters traveled to Kathy's home in Atlanta, Georgia, where they were joyfully reunited. Mm -hmm. She was able to thank him for saving her. He was overjoyed to learn how much of an impact he had on her life. (laughs) But Fred has passed away in 1998, and he was 66 at the time. Um, And at his funeral, Kathy told their story to the congregation. That is so That's nice. It's so, so nice. nice. Oh, my God. No one will ever do that at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I have never saved a child. There's I still time. I hate myself. <laughs> so, oh, my God. Um, and then I found some information a little bit on Medium.com from an article by Fatim Hemraj, and it said, um, not much information is available on what happened to Clifford or whether he faced the consequences of his crimes. But yeah. there are rumors he was murdered by the mother of a girl he sexually assaulted in 1982. Oh. Yes, 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 So yes, yes. Got that vigilante justice, vigilante <laughs> justice. Mama justice. It's Mama wild. justice. I mean, I can't blame her. Don't touch my baby. I'll fucking uh. kill ya. <laughs> so, and then... Medium also had a screen grab of a filmed reunion of the two. So there was a filmed reunion for UMI, and I don't know why FilmRise didn't put that in. Yes, I hate that. It's not on our disc selection? I need to check the discs because maybe it's there, but... And then there was just one quote from Kathy that said, The first thing out of my mouth was, I love you. Oh! To when she saw him. Oh. There was one message board comment from a user named Lit Up, and it said, I sent her a message on social media. She said that Clifford Starks was murdered by a woman whose daughter he molested around 81 or 82. I'm a survivor and doing well. Thank you. Oh, wow. That was someone that actually talked to her. 
So, and then I found a couple news articles that had mentions of Kathy, but they didn't have anything to do with her story from UM or Fred Lyle, but they mentioned her because she was the archives director for Atlanta Public Schools. So, yeah, so she's just a queen, and we love her. Yeah. I love her. Love. And I'm so glad she turned out okay. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. So good. Rough. That's a rough one. Oh, gosh, yeah. Real rough. I know. I was like, this was supposed to be a Lost Loves. What's happening? Yeah. (laughs) And then it it did turn around. It turned around, (laughs) but, boy, it it was not easy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that was part one of season four, episode nine. Nine. It's confusing when you do a lot of things in one day. And for part two, next week, come back. I'm covering the unexplained death of Beverly McGowan. And I'm covering the wanted segment of Sal Gordado. So we love you so much, honeys. We don't tell you often enough, but we really love you. I just want to say that. It's true. We're glad to be back. You can go to patreon.com slash resolve mysteries podcast if you need more, two extra episodes a month. If you subscribe at the $5 a month level or higher, and also add free regular episodes too, which is worth it. I think so. I, I think ads. so. <laughs> ads are the worst, even if we're reading them. To see photos that we reference in the episode, follow us on Instagram. I won't talk about ass sizes. Just follow all of our asses at Resolve Mysteries Podcast. All of our asses are working hard. They're also working on, hard on Facebook and Twitter at Resolve the Pod. And if you want to send us your stories for listener short stacks or you just want to talk to us, you can contact us at Resolve Mysteries Podcast.com, Resolve Mysteries Podcast at gmail.com, or at our P.O. Box 14005, Portland, Oregon 97293. And really do keep sending us your stories for listener short stacks. We love to read what you have to say. We love to feel like we're talking to you. And then read them back on episodes so we can keep making those. And that can really be anything surrounding the show, Unsolved Mysteries, cold cases you're interested in, anything you want to tell us about. And last but not least, you hear it all the time, but please subscribe. It really helps. Just go click that button. And also leave us a five-star rating and review. And just a reminder, for every review we receive, we donate a dollar to an organization. And this month's Tweet Tweet is the Wild Bird Fund. (laughs) Help us help those birdies out. Truly, we are full of bird lovers. We love them. Mm -hmm. Truly, we love you. We'll see you next week. Bye. 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 are the worst even if we're reading them we don't like them (laughs) we don't want to listen to it don't say that (laughs) but don't skip on listen to all of them do keep advertising with us companies thank you